and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. Every week, I'm talking to thought leaders around the world who are knee deep in their work tackling some of the world's most difficult problems. And still, they think the future is bright and there's all kinds of possibility ahead of us. We need to know what they know. We need to see what they see. We need to know how they are getting around their obstacles, how, how they find opportunity and setbacks. And they are living with a burning sense of excitement about all that's possible. I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, founder of Ever Widening Circles, a platform, well, actually four platforms, all aimed at shining a light on insight and innovation going uncelebrated. Experience tells me that there is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about. But today we're going to start a conversation in the world of conservation that is absolutely changing that. And there's a lot of conversation around the thought leaders work that we're going to share with you today. Today we're going to meet Damian Mander. Damian um, is a conservation innovator who has discovered that single mothers make the best game wardens in Africa. And everything that comes with that insight has a connection to how you and I go forward in the world and what we can learn from all of his experience and um, how we can matter in his project and others just like that. So Damien, welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. Linda, g'day, and thank you very much for having us. Great to be well, here. <laughs> Damien and I have been trying to connect forever. He's um, always... <laughs> Uh, in the bush, in the thick of things, and I feel even guilty taking 55 minutes of his time, but we're going to make this count so that we can get people to not only support your project, know you're out there, uh, feel the passion that you do for it, but also to learn a bunch of things that you've learned in navigating this crazy world of social entrepreneurship. Oh, brilliant. No, thank you very much. So sure, um, I'm going to put this through the sieve of what I'm calling the, the innovator's recipe. Um, I wrote a book uh, that published almost a year ago uh, called Happiness is an Option, uh, doing better than just surviving in the era of the internet. <laughs> and in that book, I talk about the fact that I've written about in my organization at Everwhiting Circles has written about, about about 1,700 innovators who are changing the future for us all. And over that time period, we discovered there's these five characteristics that, um, that are very common to people like you who have found innovative ways to tackle very old problems. So if you don't mind, I've studied your website carefully. I've seen all your TED Talks. I wanna bring this conversation to people who are in business and, and trying to be innovators themselves or who just wanna find a way to matter in this world. Um, and we'll put it through the sieve of the innovators recipe, okay? Hit me. Okay, the first thing, uh, there are five things that innovators do. The first is that they, they don't just launch in anywhere on a problem, or sometimes they do, but then they quickly learn to peel back the onion. And I think you've got parts of your story that uh, involve starting one place, thinking things were a, a one way, and then winding up somewhere else. Um, so let's start there. That's the beginning of the innovators challenge. They, they, aren't, they aren't content to just start at the obvious. Yeah, I mean, look, for, for me, the important thing is always to get started, uh, to find a start point and to get some momentum. And uh, you know, we've got some amazing people in, in our team uh, that will probably come at things from a, from a more analytical uh, standpoint. And, and it's important to have a team around you that can help uh, push an idea forward, I think. Um, you know, I'm, but I'm often, I would say, I'm more of a sledgehammer uh, in terms of, of getting things going and, and you know the, the mindset you can't steer a stationary ship uh, so and I I you know and I you know me me, me and my team we you know some of the people on my team we have these brilliant arguments where I'm coming at something from this creative this creative side and they're looking at it from an analytical side they're like no this is this is a great drawing but it's going to collapse and and the, the the important thing is we meet somewhere in the middle uh, and we refine it over time uh, or we, we evolve it. We cut away the bits that don't work, keep the bits that do. Now, look, that's not to say that I couldn't sit here and plan and, 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 and start something a little bit later uh, and for it to go a lot more smoother from the beginning. Um, but, I, you know, the, as, as the famous saying goes, you know, a great plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. So for me, the important thing is to start. 
Uh, and then even more important than starting is, is not to stop, just to persevere and to push through because it's not going to be easy. And I remember I was actually, I was doing a podcast last year and someone says, you know, what, what gives you the confidence to be able to go out and do something uh, in what can be a very tough environment? And, and that, that wasn't a, a question just generic to, to the environment that I am, but just life in general. What gives you the confidence to be able to go out and take a leap? And my response was, well, sometimes there is no confidence. Sometimes we are just jumping out into the void, knowing that it's you know somewhere something is going to stick. And I think that that's the important thing, at least for me. And the, and the way we we're, we're all different as human beings. We we have different ways of approaching things. But being able to take that leap, um, having no comfort uh, sometimes, uh, having no no safety net there to catch you, but knowing that forward momentum is better than than you know for me i mean the most scariest thing is to be stagnant to be comfortable uh to 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 just have built something then to, to relax and say okay this is it this is the way i'm going to surround myself for the foreseeable future i'm always trying to innovate i'm always trying to trying to push things forward and do things better and a lot of the time yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well out of my comfort zone and that's where i feel um I feel in, in a strange way i feel feel the most comfortable yeah, that comfort zone. <laughs> this is one of the things I've noticed about the pandemic is it's all it's it's shaken us up just enough to get out of that and start questioning. I don't know if you've heard, but I've heard this term that we're going through what some people are calling the great reset or the great resignation. I really think it's the great questioning, questioning our priorities, what we're spending our time doing. And you've got a great um, you've got a great story of of um, of how you're really bringing an outsider's perspective to to a problem that's well probably been evolving since the dawn of human history. So, Damien, tell us a little bit about where you started because um, this is another thing I noticed is that people think they can't get started because they're an outsider or because yeah. you know yeah. they, they need some social proof that they're going to have what it takes. Take yeah. us back to the beginning of your story because that's really helpful to people who want to live with purpose. Yeah, you know, and I, I get an email a day from someone who is trying to figure out how to get started or, you know, looking for an opportunity. And and it, it is exactly where I was uh, back in 2009 when I was emailing a bunch of people. Um, so, you know, you know, we really want to get involved. How, how, do I, how do I get a start? And the difference between me and, and sort of 99% of the other people that are trying to get started in, in the industry like this is I got on a plane and I came over to the problem. And I jumped right into the middle of the problem. And a lot of people will sit there on the peripheral sending emails looking for a red carpet rolled out to say, you know, come in, you know, here's that safety net that I was just talking about that, that most of the time is not there. Um, for me, uh, you know, it was, you know, I, I, I tried. I didn't get the response that I wanted. So I came over to see for myself. And, and so much is done around the campfire or on the ground or, or jumping into the middle of, of the problem and then seeing, seeing where it sticks. And, and look, I mean, most of what we've achieved and we, 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 we are innovating in, in, in amazing ways, uh, our team and our organization in an industry that you know, I would say has been largely stagnant for a while. And at no point did we sit there and map out this master plan and go, you know, this is, this is how it's all going to work. Okay. We did it by just pushing forward and evolving as we go. And, and I would say that has been uh, not only our evolution as an organization, but also mine as an individual. And, you know, I, I often refer to, to nature because that's where, where we work in, you know, nature has, has had billions of years to evolve and evolution has no predetermined path. It, it is the cutting away of the bits that don't work, the retention of the bits that do and, 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 and forward momentum. And as humans, we don't have billions of years. We have a handful of decades at best. Uh, uh, and that is treating every day as a lesson and, and, you know, how can we improve ourselves? How can we improve our organizations and what it is that we're here for our purpose, the most elusive thing in life. When I arrived in Africa, I just finished my last mission or last purpose. And that was with being in the military uh, for whatever you know, reason, you know, that may be how I perceive it or how other people perceive it as good or bad, constructive and non-constructive. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost not irrelevant to what was next. Uh, what, what, 
what mattered was at the time I was I was in this void of not having uh, not having a purpose. The, the network around me was gone. I didn't have the military around me anymore. I didn't have the the brothers that were there that cared about my life more than I cared about it myself. I, I just had an idea uh, that I wanted to be involved with something. And that that's where all this began. Uh, I, I got out, I found a place to start. It, it certainly wasn't the place I was six months later. And it was miles away from where I was 12 months later, but it was a start. And, and only when we start something can we figure out the direction that we're going to take. I love this. This is this is very useful information um, for people that are feeling these voids in life. I, I, I love that. I had a thought leader recently talk to me about institutional voids that, you know, for instance, I perceive the, the void on the Internet. The institutional void is trust. We, we, mm. we don't have that. What did you discover was the void that was in conservation um, when you dove in? Well, having come from a military background um, and I came over and stepped into the industry at a time when it was becoming increasingly militarized, or at least that was the parts, the segments that I chose to look at. If you're a, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? Yes. Uh, and so, and, I, and in particular, elephants and rhinos that were being targeted in, in very aggressive or militarized tactics by small armed militia units crossing international borders using uh, automatic weapons, heavy caliber rifles, and coming in to kill these animals uh, an animal the size of a truck kill for something you can hold in one hand to be sold into the black market as another form of currency alongside guns, drugs, and human trafficking. Uh, and that, that, that worked for me. Um, and to be fair, I, I ended up making a lot of the same mistakes that we'd made in Iraq uh, using this sort of, uh, I would say, and, and, and a conversation that's very relevant in America at the moment in terms of the overuse of force um, in policing of society. Uh, and in Iraq, when we, we were, even though I was working as part of the coalition, uh, we were working and training Iraqi national police and Iraqi special police, and it was a very militarized approach. And even though we were training local forces, um, when I say local forces, I mean Iraqi forces, the Iraqi forces that we, we were deploying were not from the areas that they were deployed to. So that even though they were Iraqis, they were still deemed to be an occupying force. And when I came into conservation, it was still fairly similar. We were men from around the country we were recruited to form a unit to go out and protect a nature preserve from the local community. Now, those men weren't from those local communities. They were, they were from, in some cases, hundreds of miles away. Uh, and so there was this level of resistance and, and quite often our biggest threats came from the local communities. These, these, these uh, communities that lived all along the borders of the areas we were trying to protect. And so there was this very much this line in the sand mentality of this is nature that's communities and we're going to defend this line with with big offenses and more guns and you know that that that, that works great for me uh you know and to to a, a fairly large extent it worked it worked but on a continent that the un population division says is going to have two billion people by 2040 it's not the long-term solution uh and there's only so long you can hold back communities of tens of thousands of people living along alongside an area that you're trying to protect that's the size of a small country. Uh, you need to have the community on site. And, and I used to I spend a lot of time lecturing around the world, you know, about, about what we do and about the lessons we've learned. And, and I, I used to start my lecture saying this and don't think of what we're doing as the answer. So even though what we, what we were doing at the time was working, I would acknowledge that it wasn't the answer. And I would say, you know, there's people specialize much more on the community side of things that are trying to find long-term solutions to get a growing human population on this continent to value wildlife uh you know these are these are often communities that that uh you know trying to figure out where their next meal has come from trying to get them to see the value of wildlife in, in, over the next several decades is is a, is a far stretch so and my the way i sold what we did was you know think of us as a paramedic we're trying to stop the hemorrhaging and we're trying to get the situation to the operating table. Okay, so, so a doctor can take over and, and save this thing. And that, that, is, uh, uh, that is essentially what we did uh, as we scaled up from a single person organization in, in October 2009 when we registered uh, right through until uh, 2017 when we completely shifted um, everything we did as an organization in what was an you know, organizational rebirth 
and uh, and a complete shift in in, in operational strategy, um, not only in, in how we went about our operations, but the areas we chose. Uh, and so yeah, it's been, um, it, it, you know, it would be fair to say, and look, I can say this because I, I invested uh, an entire real estate portfolio, spending my own money figuring this out, as well as you know, other people's money that, that we also raised. And I will say we, we achieved a lot uh, in the years that it took us um, to get to where we are now. But I will say it took us seven years to figure out what we did as an organization. Uh, and those seven years involved me um, being kicked out of the country that, I, that I've called home, um, being exiled for two and a half years, accused of espionage. Um, it involved me losing my life savings. It involved me losing a house uh, that I'd built in a country that I, that I, I you know, was, you know, wanted to call home and eventually was able to get back into and, and now call home and, you know, having, um, you know, working with a team that, that protects one of the largest land portfolios um, in, the, in the country. Uh, so there's been a lot of hurdles along the way, uh, uh, but they've all been worth it. And without going through those hurdles, we wouldn't have been channeled down the paths that we ended up walking. This is it. <laughs> there, are you familiar with a, a philosopher from the 1990s named Joseph Campbell? Never met him. Joseph Campbell had this huge series. It was viewed by like 300 million uh, yeah. people in okay. the 1990s and <laughs> he talked about something called the hero's journey now i know you don't see yourself as a hero at all but yeah. it is the journey that you just talked about he really simplified it and um part of that journey is the is the um separation so you, you first got to separate from all you knew and all you thought and all your biases as best you can then that's called the second session is called the descent and we all, we social entrepreneurs are very familiar with that. The third phase is called the ordeal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you've had your share of that. But the fourth phase is what I really want to celebrate is that you've been willing to go through that journey and kept on going because the, the, he calls the fourth phase, the return. Yeah. And okay. when I hear you talk about community and how that was the, the light bulb moment um, when you discovered this insight about why single mothers make the best game wardens in Africa. Yeah. This is returning. This is returning to our core. So let's continue with this recipe. So the first thing the best innovators in the world do is they peel back the onion. And that sounds like what you did. You came at the problem with everything that you had, and then you peeled back the onion and discovered um, that it was quite different, that the solution may be starting a quite different place. The other, the second thing that innovators do really good ones is they put things together that no one ever thought to combine. Yeah. So tell me how you made that transition. Cause I know people can catch up on your background on is, are there two TEDx talks, Damien or three? Yeah, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a couple of TEDx talks. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's also, yeah, you know, several podcasts that we've yeah. done recently as well. Uh, I um, also speak on the, the national geographic speakers yes. bureau. So right. um in the, in the the live talks across North America, uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna just yeah. so people know we're gonna have all links to those in the show notes. And this, yeah. this interview, Damien, is gonna be an article for ever for the for the um the news magazine at Ever Widening Circles online. So yeah. it's gonna be a podcast and a and a, a, a an article. So they'll be able to catch all those events because you really got to hear Damien tell the the origin story. But the part that I think is interesting is how you made this leap from thinking things were one way and then finding they, the solution might be quite another. So what led to that, those moments? Yeah. And it's, I mean, to use your, your onion analogy there, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of sitting there and studying the onion, you know, we were chewing our way through it, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, not through. sitting there figuring out what's, you know, what's going to be there and, you know, trying to analyze the best way to the center. It's just like we were ripping it away one layer at a time. And, uh, you know, there, there was, there was a lot of pain and heartache al along the way. Uh, I won't lie. Um, and at once, uh, 2016, you know, you know, almost walked away from it. And now, now you almost feel, you know, without sounding arrogant, bulletproof, um, uh, yes. because the shit that worries me, uh, or worried me, me years ago is just, it's water off a duck's back. Uh, now, honestly, uh, and, and, it, and to the point where, uh, we know how to navigate most of the challenges. Um, and if we don't know, we have a team 
that will find a solution. And when we get given a challenge, we actually, it, I mean, it's, it's almost like a blessing. It's like, okay, we've got something in front of us here that we have to figure out a solution for. It's not easy. It's not pretty. We're in a dynamic environment. Um, we're dealing with organized crime syndicates. We're dealing with, 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 with massive geographical areas across multiple uh, political boundaries, cultures, languages. Uh, we know that when we get through this next challenge and we find a solution for it, we're all going to be more refined as individuals and we're going to be stronger as an organization and that that for me i mean at the, what we're doing at the moment i mean i can tell you now there was there was no session in as part of sniper, sniper training that taught you how to scale a multinational organization uh and here we are at the moment and you know, trying to we're sitting we've got 270 staff we're trying to double that in the next sort of 12 to 18 months as we scale up to take on almost six million uh, more acres of wilderness under long-term management with local indigenous communities uh and all of that has been a learning process as, as we as we as we we've gone along uh it's been so 2017 was the change the 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 significant change for us uh we were running uh you know what was going to be becoming an increasingly um prominent uh operation along the the south african border on the mozambique side of the border helping to protect the eastern flank of the largest remaining uh rhinoceros population on the planet it was where 70 percent of all rhinos on the planet were being killed each year it was the reason that rhino poaching was on the global stage uh, and we had this very um, militarized approach to protecting that that boundary uh, we got a lot of kudos for it because we helped drive down um, incursions of poaching from mozambique into south africa in 2016 uh late 2016 for the first time in a decade an international downturn in rhino poaching had been announced uh, and we we played a, a role uh, in achieving that alongside a bunch of other organizations. Uh, but we were the ones that went into the eye of the storm there, essentially on the piece of land that separated the, the, the largest population of Rhino in the world from where most of the syndicates were operating in, in Mozambique. And uh, despite the success we were having there, uh, the you know I would lay lay in bed. Uh, awake at night just saying you know this is not the answer it's not the way forward and uh you know there was a series of of sort of circumstances there that just it, it's it's the pressure i think that pushes you um to try and find something uh find something different um and that we you know we were getting pressure from 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 several angles um you know one one angle uh, in particular was this knowing that this militarized response against local indigenous communities was was uh you know not necessarily the the long-term way forward in conserving nature um, but the other one too was we were working in private lands uh and we really struggled to get buy-in with government in terms of working in national parks, national parks falling under a federal system. So we hadn't made that leap yet into, into these, these areas. And, uh, and we'd been sort of, you know, I'd, I'd also, you know, had the, the stain on me of, of essentially being, you know, publicly ejected from Zimbabwe, uh, which for a lot of people in the industry, I, I think, uh, uh you know I, I you know i was viewed as this sort of charlatan you know media guy that came in from australia and essentially was just this going to be this fly-by-nighter that that came over here and got a bit of money and a bit of media attention and and made a splash and then that was it and so i think i think um and look i think the um the that assessment from from certainly you know quite a lot of people was probably a fair one um you know they didn't have reason to to know that i was still going to be here 12 years later um and and i often think our industry is is probably our biggest enemy um it's not necessarily the, the organized crime syndicates we go against it's the actual industry we try and work within uh where everyone's fighting for funding they're fighting for, for public attention and they're fighting for for projects and and you know so i make a real effort now of trying to work with people that that make the effort on the ground to get started because you know i'm i'm trying to save them an extra couple of years and you know maybe an extra you know couple of bucks along the way that that mm -hmm. I, you know i could have really done with that mentorship um back when i was getting going instead it was a sort of you know push to the side go and figure it out yourself mm -hmm. so that for us you know that was really one of the great pressures um in, in my life that i would say has become the biggest asset 
And, and, and very often I think when we feel um, where we're feeling excluded or we're feeling pressure or, or um, you know, these, these you know, really hard times, it's very hard to see that just around the corner there's something very positive. Uh, and, it, 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 I mean, for us, it was, it was, it was the case more than, than anything else I've ever experienced in life, uh, just get through this hard time. And the, the, all the hardships we were going to was actually an answer for me. And, uh, and that's that's exactly what happened to us um, in um, 2017. We had this big project going along the border. I was on a fundraising trip to America. Um, I actually went to a fundraiser for another um, organization that was uh, uh, deploying women a lot in conservation, but it was in a limited capacity. Uh, and... You know, and I, and I, I, I that they were being portrayed as doing all the roles that a male would do in conservation in a in a, in a front line operational uh, capacity, oh. but I knew that they weren't, and I knew that that it was actually an all male um, security team that was doing the roles that these women were being portrayed as doing. So, so that that was a, a query for me. Um, and the query was, you know, well, why, why aren't women just given the opportunity to do all of these roles um, in an industry where they're outnumbered on the front lines at a ratio of around 100 to 1 in, in genuine operational roles? In an industry where if you want to be a manager, you need to have that experience um, because when things go bad and you have to make decisions, people's lives are on the line. Uh, and so for women not getting the access to that level of experience they needed to rise into, into, into management, uh, conservation, put it this way, if we were getting it right, the situation would have been much better. So while other industries were moving ahead by getting more women on, on the board, the CEOs in management, uh, and in these, right. these, these, for lack of a better term, these power roles, yeah. uh, you know, we, we were not, we were still dealing with the issue of conservation on the ground in a very sort of biceps and bullets way, you know, this, this go out and, 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 you know, the good guy with the gun mentality. And um, uh, I was then reading an, an article while I was in New York on the same trip uh, about um, the U.S. Army Rangers uh, deploying women or training you know, women in preparation for deployment. And a decade before reading that article, uh, one of our, um, we were on, a, on a routine mission in northern Baghdad that was, was hit by a uh, by roadside bomb going through a checkpoint. Um, it, uh, you know, one of our vehicles had been hit, a few people at the checkpoint had been killed. We pushed through the contact zone, uh, but were very quickly surrounded. Um, local militia and Māori Army uh, and you know, it was, you, you know, if I if I had if I had to look back now and say, you know, this is probably a time where where um, things were were, were not going to end well. This was it. You know, they were they were trying to pull guys out of the lead vehicle. I was sitting there. I had a vehicle pull up next to me. I had a Dushka anti aircraft gun, um, you know, inches from my face. Um, we 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 had zero place to go. And uh, we have, you know, there's two red buttons in the vehicle, uh, which are, uh, we, we call the panic buttons, very aptly named. Um, and we, we pushed these, um, the panic buttons. Um, within a few minutes, we had two Apache gunships circling our position. Um, and they gave us uh, cover um, uh, for a couple of extra minutes until the US Army Rangers came in. Uh, and managed to get us out alive um, and got us back to a, what they call a fall before operating base. Uh, so about a decade later, I'm reading that article thinking that if the unit that was good enough to have saved my life in northern Baghdad uh, back in 2007 um, is now training women to be army rangers in 2017, then maybe we should look at why women are not being given the opportunity to be wildlife rangers. And that that was the that was the catalyst uh, for us to say, let's find a place to make this work. I just had goosebumps from head to toe. I think that <laughs> I just did. Yeah. Yeah, that's always a sign for me. <laughs> okay, I think you just realized one of the uh, or spoke to one of the really important things about how we're going to get ourselves out of a bunch of trouble in this world is that we've got to be able to reflect back on manage the meaning of things. It sounds like, you know, you, you really manage the meaning of that, that moment um, way back 10 years earlier. And then you were connecting things that, that 
no one had connected before. That, that's exactly the way it works is that somebody has that aha moment that these two things could be valuable in combination. And why wouldn't we? But most of the, most of the best um, leaps that we've ever made in human history are when our backs are to the wall as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, pressure is an amazing thing. Uh, it, it produces the best results. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So the the five, so I, I think that I'm just going to tell you what the five uh, innovators recipe characteristics are, and you can speak to anyone that, that suits you, but you, we've talked about two of them. First, these in, real good innovators don't just take things as they see it. They're willing to go through what you've gone through to just keel, keep peeling back the onion to find the original source of the problem. Then they're willing to connect two things that no one ever thought to combine, which is what you did in the story that you just, just told us. The next thing they do is they look around themselves and instead of inventing or demanding a whole bunch of new stuff, they look at what resources are available all around them that are going unused. They look at mm. surplus. Did you um, how, does that resonate um, with what you were doing? Because it seems like we no one was looking or no one was looking in that particular corridor as women as a resource. Their perspectives, their 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 power, their particular take on things. Look, we we took a bunch of things from uh, our own industry and other industries that were either working or that had failed. Um, and we found the reasons why they'd failed and we introduced the working parts to, to turn it into a working model. And, uh, and that in itself is, 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 became a unique recipe. Uh, and that, um, you know, even as we go forward and everything from, I mean, the, our social media, the way we do social media, we don't try and reinvent the way we do our social media from scratch. We look at the organizations that are doing it the best and we try and figure out how we fit our narrative into that model. And uh, and and in, in some aspects, you know, we'll grab a, a, you know a few different ideas from different places and pull them together and and test and adjust as we as we go along. Um, there was a there was a, a certain amount of um, you know the unknown when we move forward in in putting women through um, the selection process and the training process that we did because. There hadn't there had never been a fully armed um, unit of women um, deployed to manage what what is now a network of nature reserves. It's the only network of nature reserves in the world that are protected by women, um, and that hadn't been done before. And we we not only dealing uh, in a very um, I would say male dominated industry, um, but we also working in very patriarchal societies uh, and cultures. Um, and also in a, in a country that when I first arrived in 2009 had the lowest life expectancy in the world for a woman, which was 36 years of age. Uh, so we, 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 we had all these sort of barriers, whether they were cultural, um, psychological, um, whether they were institutional, um, us as an organisation, we'd been beating this sort of militarised drum uh, for the better part of, of, of a decade. Uh, I myself, having come from the ultimate boys club of special operations, having built a career across three continents in training and deploying men, having never worked with women. Uh, and here we were having this internal discussion as an organization on, okay, let's, let's go and try an all female anti-boaching unit. And, you know, there's, there's people with, you know, this has to get through board level. We're going to, we're about to go and spend, um, spend some donors money. Uh, and, uh, and also the perspective, um, or the microscope that we were going to come under from our existing supporters who like had signed up for this sort of direct action, go out and catch the bad guy type mentality. And then the people that were going to, that were going to judge us and say, this was just some sort of, um, fundraising, uh, um, filter that we're adding over our other projects. Um, you know, they're, they're all fair. They are all fair questions for people to ask, uh, you know, and, and that's why you know we, as we've gone forward and we've had to had to refine this model, where you know we we just have to be trying to be, you know, you know one step ahead of of all the the potential criticism that we're going to face, um, and just make sure we've got answers for everything. And I'll say one thing too, also, and and uh, it seems as though you know out of all the stuff we've done with conservation, I say working with with women's empowerment, it seems as though there's been more critics waiting under every second rock for something to go wrong. Uh, 
and to be able to point something out. And uh, look, we're not a women's empowerment organization. We are a conservation organization. We just found a better way to do business. Uh, there are some organizations uh, that will embrace women's empowerment and, and gender equality because they think they have to. Some will do it because of regulatory change. Some will only do it because the bottom line adds up. Uh, uh, and whatever the reason, uh, you know, you need to you need to be ready as as an organisation to be able to um, uh, you know deal with with a cultural change, and that's that's what we that's what we embraced. Um, we recognised that we weren't that you know we couldn't just get a bunch of women and train them and, and put them out there in the bush, and then that was us changing uh, our organisation and our industry and then building a new model. We had to rebuild our organisation. We brought in an external third party um, that specialises in, in, in doing gender mainstreaming audits, and we, we broke down everything from our, our, our board ratios, our senior management levels, um, our policies and procedures, our code of ethics and conduct, and we rebuilt these as an organization that could truly stand behind what we do operationally as a best practice model and say, this is not just about um, training a bunch of women um, from marginalized areas in Africa and seeing all the benefits that flow on. This is about rebuilding an organization that uh, has, a, has a, a very equitable structure in it um, that can be replicated in, in other places. This, so, the, the model is working so well operationally. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense for us to try and hold on to it and say, we're going to be the only ones to do this. What it is up to us to do, because we are at the forefront of, of, of what we're doing, is to be able to build the systems that others can replicate and take on board and spread this um, spread this success um, further. And, and so in that respect, uh, look, the critics have been great um, because they have, you know, alongside what we thought we were doing right, uh, we also get highlighted or enough points get brought up in, in things that we maybe we weren't looking at because we didn't have all the answers in the beginning. And so when you, when, when, you know, critics, critics can be great because they'll sit there throwing rocks and they think they're, they think they're, 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 they're making their point to and, and, and trying to bring you down. They're actually helping you identify areas that you can strengthen. And, um, and that's exactly what we did. Okay. So let me, let me see if I've got this right, because I, I, uh, this is such an immense journey that you have um that you've been on that you you're that we're all going on to figure out a way to live with wild places and community and all that 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 where those friction points so is it does it work like this damien just to and by all means i want you to correct my perception so my perception is that i learned from a little bit of work uh in diving into your background that organized crime is at the very highest level of the trade in endangered species body parts is that is that fair enough yeah the um the illegal trade in wildlife is is um, one of the largest criminal ind industries in the world um guns drugs human trafficking and and counterfeit um uh, uh, currency so uh, okay so uh, yeah we, we we are dealing with some you know some very serious um right. role players um some dangerous people um we're taking money you know every time we're successful at what we do we are taking money from organized crime okay so then at that level underneath that that only works uh that that system works best i'm sure it works everywhere but it works best in places that um there's a lot of scarcity for human beings because there's the motivation you got to feed your family you yeah. you and i talked about um that interview that i did with nate robinson he's the marine biologist who started that whole movement against straws drinking straws he's the guy mm -hmm. that pulled the straw out of the turtle's nose and um that's one of the points he makes in this fabulous interview i had with him is that <laughs> it's silly to talk about conservation and enforce communities on the edges of all these wonderful conservation gems if they can't put, put food on their table for their yeah. families it's it's a mute point you can't throw enough army tactics at that at that human um that problem of human existence no e e exactly and look this comes this comes back to our evolution um of coming at things uh 
from 180 degrees of, of from where we started. Um, the important thing is that we did start and we figured out you know, how, to, how to make that transition across and achieved a lot of success along the way. But from the beginning where we had this, what's termed as fortress conservation, um, you do, you're protecting an area from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very much a wildlife and nature first uh, approach. Uh, and to where we are now, uh, we, we deal with conservation from a social impact standpoint. Um, so we're coming from the outside in, we're working with the communities and from the social sides and the dilemmas that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And to go back to my previous point, you know, getting them to see the long-term value of, of wildlife versus uh, the opportunity for a meal on the table tonight. And, uh, and you know, that, uh, that, that, that all started with um, our evolution um, in our strategy where we centralised that strategy around women's empowerment. Um, that gave us the greatest traction in community development and there's an overwhelming body of evidence that tells us empowering women is the single greatest um, force for positive change in the world today. So putting women at the centre of that strategy, giving us the greatest traction in community development, conservation became a byproduct um, of our social impact. Uh, now, the, the, I, 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 when people ask us, you know, what's making this work, I can generally distill it down to, to sort of three key, um, three key angles in, in terms of, of what we do and why women are different in law enforcement. And I can say this now, um, with more than two decades of, of experience in law enforcement, um, military, combat, um, deploying forces around the world, training, uh, whether they be police or, or military forces, uh, I can say that uh, putting women into the forefront of law enforcement changes the dynamics of society for the better. And this is a, this is a big idea. Uh, and it's not just an idea for us anymore. It's, it's actually something that we, we were fortunate enough to have a blank canvas to trial. We can't just go into Chicago and say, hey, we're going to get and I shift all the male roles out and replace them with women and see what happens. But because of the, the, just the, the sheer geographical spaces that we have um, to protect in Africa uh, and around the world for that matter, and the lack of infrastructure that exists, the lack of investment that exists, we were able to go out to areas that had no, um, they were essentially lawless in regards to, to protection um, because the money had run out, the conservation efforts had, had moved out of the area. And so we, we were fortunate enough to have that blank canvas and to be able to negotiate with the local government and, and the traditional hierarchy um, in society there and say, listen, we want to we trial this method and we want to see what happens. Uh, and look, I mean, there's three main things uh, that, that have led to the success. But there's a whole bunch of, of other positive things that have spun off, uh, uh, which I don't even have, you know, I mean, we could sit here and talk um, all day and I'm sure, I'm sure you'd love to. But uh, let, let's start with the three main things. The first one is um, we haven't had a single incidence of corruption uh, with the women. Now, uh, in the Global Corruption Index, if Denmark was to rank number one as the least corrupt country in the world, Zimbabwe ranks around 155 out of 176 countries. Um, so just being able to remove corruption from our daily um, grind, our, our, you know, the daily task of going out and, and trying to preserve nature, being able to remove corruption from that equation, it, it's, it's half of our work done already uh, in terms of time saved, effort saved, money saved. Uh, and that, that is such a key component. But what it did is it shifted the entire economics of what we did. Um, the areas that we now protect that have bought up, now bearing in mind of what I said earlier, we struggled and struggled to get buy-in at national government level uh, in, in um, getting into national parks and working with, uh, you know, it would be like me coming to America and saying, you know, I want to get involved with training the police force as opposed to going and saying, I'm going to try and work with training a private security company. Okay, so we, we, we didn't have the in with the national governments that we wanted. Um, and so, and this was also fueled by um, the espionage accusations that I had back in 2012, which took some years to clear and be able to get back into the country and, and, and you know, now to a point where, the, you know, where we are now, the president's daughter is, is one of our volunteer rangers and we have great support. Um, 
with with the government but <laughs> we were able to find now in africa there's what's called uh, tribal land trusts uh, or communal land trusts now these are areas that are owned by local indigenous communities that are wilderness areas and they have the rights to try and generate an income from these areas commercially okay. uh, now whether that be photographic tourism or what we have found uh, which was the, a key model in a lot of the areas was trophy hunting so they would have an, they would lease out large areas uh, to a trophy hunting operator that operator would then get set a quota or a number of animals that they were allowed to hunt each year and an international hunter would pay uh, you know x amount of dollars to come over and hunt those animals now that industry is dying um, because of reduced wildlife populations because of a changing policy on uh, whether or not people can export the trophy that they've shot to the countries they live in. But uh, I say most significantly, a younger generation raised on, on in a digital media world that they can see what hunting is up close and just don't want to be involved with it. So there's a shrinking client base. Now across Africa, yeah, there's twice as much land set aside under tribal land trust as what there is national parks. So these are significant tracts of land um, that hold... Uh, uh, the key strategic value across large wilderness landscapes because they surround national parks and they sit on the edges of these, um, these ecosystems um, right alongside uh, where the communities are. So they are the footprint with which to have the relationship with the communities. So historically with us uh, and in, in, with many organisations and in particular with uh, government national parks departments, Men are recruited from across the country. They are brought in and formed a unit to protect an area from which the local population at some point has been historically ejected from to create these wilderness areas. Mm. So there's already, one, there's already a level of resentment and two, that resentment is amplified because it's an, it's an external force or an occupying force that's brought in to protect these areas. Uh, but what that does economically is it disperses the largest line item in our budget. Uh, which is the salaries of rangers. Instead of that going back into the community at household level as a community investment, that money is going around uh, the, the country back to the hometowns or villages of where these men had been recruited from. Now, with, and we, we did that to avoid corruption, uh, to avoid collusion from family members that these men may have grown up with, with other cousins, brothers, uncles, um, giving away information of where they're going to be patrolling uh, or where certain animals, high target species like an elephant or rhino may be that day. Uh, and then, of course, that, that, that information uh, being leaked out becomes a vulnerability for us and a vulnerability makes you exploitable. Um, and so now as we, as we have not had an incident of corruption with the women to date, um, four years into this, uh, this, this particular program, uh, as we've scaled, we have been able to continually draw from women in the communities um, surrounding the areas we're trying to protect. So that has turned the largest line item in our budget as something that was being dispersed around the country into something that is now going back into the community um, at household level, predominantly into the hands of women. We are able to show on paper that we're putting the same amount into these communities every 34 days as what trophy hunting was doing per annum uh, when they were using oh trophy. Gosh. Yeah, so we actually, we actually found an economic alternative to trophy hunting um, that for us is only working with women at the center of the strategy. And 99% of the people around the world, 99.9%, .9 I say, if you went up and say, hey, we want to go and hunt some animals to protect an area, you know, that, I mean, people tend to hate trophy hunting. Okay, the only thing I hate more than that, uh, than, 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 than the ethics of that is that as an international community, we've relied on it as the only economic model to support such large tracts of wilderness for so long. And people want to hate on hunting, but they don't want to offer you an, an alternative. And so we wanted to look at hunting as an equation to be solved rather than an argument to be had. Uh, and the, like on paper, I can, every 34 days, um, we're, we're equaling hunting. The bottom line actually triple gears because women spend 80 to 90% of their salary on a family 
um, on their family and local community versus a male that spends 30 to 40 percent so that changes that for us changes the economics um, the fact that we, we we don't have corruption uh, it allows us to spend the same dollar three times first on women's empowerment uh, as the center of the strategy second as on community development and third the same dollar is being spent as it was initially intended on on conservation um the I second question here yeah. I gotta yeah, go, jump in, go on. Okay, yeah. so just to go back to to again improve my way of thinking. So organized crime is up here, yeah. then and that's at the head of everything. And then you've got communities of scarcity that are just trying to put food on the table. Um, but what you're telling me is that by 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 applying um, all the advantages that you just mentioned and millions more, <laughs> I'm sure, of, yeah. of having women involved in this, you're probably, does organized crime um, rely on some level of individual participation from these surrounding communities? Like, are they going and getting one young man who wants to put food on the table that day um, and, and he's actually doing the, doing the, the hunting? So maybe these women know their yeah. community better than most I mean, absolutely um this is, and this is brilliant to me is that you're yeah. trying to organize crime off right at where it would have have influence in these communities because the single moms know what's going on in their communities they've had to navigate yeah. hard times they know they know how who's who's most likely to be trembling just trying to feed his five brothers and sisters and go out and kill one elephant and then he's got food for a year for them is that is that too far off the scenario yeah look uh and this is uh, i mean if you look at at or let, let's just talk a little bit more about money because you know ultimately this is what uh achieving these sort of outcomes does come down to is is money political will um and having the models to implement on the ground and the team to do it but last year in the united states there was around 449 billion dollars given to philanthropy uh to all philanthropic causes mm -hmm the largest philanthropic market in the world um religion made up around 29 percent of that you come down the list you hit healthcare. care uh, sorry education at 14 percent healthcare at nine percent you come right down the bottom to the smallest group and within that group you have uh all environmental causes um climate change conservation um animals um uh, domestic and wild local and international and that collectively makes up three percent um, of all funding available and now you come into uh, an in industry like conservation um, where the best gains are made by dealing with something from a social side and having an environmental outcome and you asking conservationists to bear the full load, the social load of the problems in the countries and the, the regions that we work in with the smallest pool of funding. Uh, and it, it, it's just, it doesn't stack up. Uh, and, you know, we, we've been sort of very innovative in the way that we, we look at funding and say, well, you know, a lot of the work that we do in communities, because a lot of our work is now social based, instead of trying to get money from a con the smallest pool of conservation and environment to do our social impact work, we go out and we look at, you know, okay, well, let's look at some healthcare funding, let's look at some education funding, uh, let's look at, at you know, social infrastructure, or rural infrastructure, roads, water sanitation, and pull from those. And that what that does is it allows us to keep our conservation money for conservation, for doing the animal stuff on the inside of the reserve. Um, now I can say, to get back to your question here, uh you know arresting people is is the least fun part of our job um but at a time when civilization has been brought to its knees as a direct result of the way that we treat nature we do need to be able to hold on to what we have left as well as regain regain ground now this requires uh innovative models that are scalable uh, we need to look after nature um, you know, on mass, um, not just have these pockets of success, but look at formulas that, that, that really are regional and how we are approaching uh, what it is we do is, is you know, we're looking at the, the largest issue we're facing um, in the history of civilization, be it uh, you know, the, the climate crisis and how can we play the biggest impact possible in the time that we have um, over the next you know, handful of decades as an organization, and that is to protect as much of the natural world as possible. Now, doing that requires us to wear this social um, 
uh, you know, brunt or this 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 weight on our shoulders and be able to work with these communities. Now, what what uh, centralising our strategy around women's empowerment has done is it has allowed us to de-escalate tension. Women have a very different way of approaching law enforcement, um, and I think this particular point is is what is most relevant to a US audience um, at the moment. Uh, is this de-escalation in tension? through community-based policing that's driven by uh, just a, a very different value system that, that women seem to have when it comes to dealing with conflict resolution. Um, women de-escalate tension and for in a, in a law enforcement or a military standpoint, that means demilitarization. So we don't have helicopters and aircraft circling and drones and military-grade hardware anymore. Um, we have something much more valuable than biceps and bullets. We have uh, interpersonal relationships that are driven by the women at household level in the in the communities that their grandparents raised their parents in, the communities that these women are raising their own families in. And that for us has become um, the most, I would say, the, the most significant um, piece of the jigsaw puzzle um, for us. Now, it also... Uh, uh, it, demilitarization and not having to, to spend all this money uh, on all this hardware, uh, we cut our operating costs by two thirds. Okay, so we, we cut our, copper, our operating costs by two thirds. The, the remaining two thirds of the funding we have, we invest in social impact programs. And one of those is job creation. Um, the other being uh, uh, education. Uh, we can't, all, all our staff have the opportunity to, to pursue whatever career path they want using our organization as a stepping stone. Um, at the, at the, the, the junior level, um, we have uh, at the moment, uh, which has just started as part of our portfolio, 120 um, primary and secondary age school children going through um, our full scholarship programs where all the school fees are covered, their books and stationery is paid for, the uniforms are paid for, these are mostly orphans and, and underprivileged children um, that show promise. Um, and that is, that is, that is um, you know, part of a long-term solution for us. The healthcare side of things uh, in um, helping to, to stock clinics when we arrive in areas is you know, women delivering babies uh, under candlelight with no drugs, no registered nurses. So just being able to get the most basic of drugs into these clinics in places where people die because they don't have access to, say, a $5 uh, malarial treatment um, uh, prophylactic. Um, people die because they don't have transport to get to a hospital. Uh, people die because they don't have basic antibiotics. So just being able to get a registered nurse into some of these clinics to deal with um, what may seem like something very simple um, to the everyday person, but compounds when you're operating in some of the most remote and harshest locations on the continent. Uh, Water sanitation um, is a very important one as well, um, being able to provide that for these communities uh, and then infrastructure roads so people can, can, can get access, you know, particularly those that, that have their own industries that they're working in to produce goods. So all of this is part of our social impact um, programs which reduce the need or the want for people in these communities to poach. We also employ a hell of a lot of, uh, a lot of men, um, roads, construction, labor um, there's a number of subject matter experts within our ranks that, that are men bearing in mind women have not had access to that experience they've needed to be able to be in these leadership positions so we are having to build that from scratch from a baseline of zero um, and you know we we now have uh, you know uh, four years down the track we have uh, a number of women in key positions in these law enforcement roles but we had to build that we had to create that. You can't you can't accelerate experience uh, or time. Um, so all of this is part of of looking at, at the multitude of of different challenges that we have and how we're going to unpack those challenges and, and 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 make it part of this model. And and definitely um, the 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 low level. Um, the, 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 the you know, poaching is divided into five different levels. Um, level one is the person pulling the trigger on the ground. Level five is, is the consumer, um, often on the other side of the world. We are operating around dealing with those first three levels, but we deal with the first level, um, not always in a law enforcement component, but from a social aspect. And, uh, and, and that's, that's how we can do it financially, uh, and that's how we do do it operationally. There is an important shift 
happening in the world right now. People in business and industry are calling it the great reset or the great resignation, but I'm calling it the great questioning. People are pausing and they're questioning their priorities, the work they do and how they live. And they are feeling there is something they are uniquely built to contribute, but they're not doing it right now, not yet. It's all across the spectrum from recent grads to nine to fivers, um, to people considering a second climb after a long successful career. Well, that's a problem that can be solved. On October 10th, the second annual Conspiracy of Goodness Summit will send you soaring with new energy, practical tools, and connections to a community that is growing in what we're calling the gratitude economy. The event will be an afternoon of short, powerful talks and interactive sessions and live Q&A. And the insights that you'll need to develop your road, your roadmap to living with purpose. The bottom line is this, people are solving some of the world's biggest problems and they still think that the future is bright for us all. We need to know what they know, how they got started, how they look at obstacles as opportunities. You can learn directly from their lived experience and connect with a community of people um, that are also goodness driven, who will celebrate and amplify your path to a purpose driven life. So join us on Sunday, October 10th from noon to three Eastern time. This event is your way to connect immediately to a wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about yet. Go to cogsummit.com for more information and tickets. That's C-O-G, Conspiracy of Goodness, summit.com. Well, I, I just listening to you, are, you know, you're connecting the dots for a lot of people here um, in their own fights to make the world a better place. We, as I mentioned, we've written about so many. And um, I want to get, uh, you're absolutely talking to the fourth, right, just now you're speaking to the, the fourth um, pillar in that um, innovator's recipe is that they find a way to include local communities as the top stakeholders. This yeah. swooping in and saving the day, that mentality that we've had for probably 100 years in conservation or yeah. more, that has got to go. <laughs> I yeah. think it's yeah. going to on. But yeah. um, I'm going to pause for a minute because um, we are hosting a wonderful um, event on October 10th um, that speaks to a lot of the, the, the practical things that you've mentioned that I'm going to make sure are highlighted very big in the in the show notes here. Um, it's, I, as I mentioned at the top of the show, there's this important shift happening in the world where people are, or some people in business industry are calling it the great reset or the great resignation. But I think you're at, you're around, you're, you're speaking around this great questioning that we're in. Like you mentioned in social media, you know, the worst thing you can do is put up a, a Facebook pay, uh, posting of you with a, um, with an endangered species that you've shot. Um, there's a very famous dentist who made the mistake of doing that. And, <laughs> and his, his time was, was uh, measured on social media as far as being a positive impact. But um, we are hosting an event on October 10th. It's an afternoon of, um, of some great uh, public speakers who are gonna give short talks and then we're gonna have Q and A and we're gonna try and bring a community together around what we're calling the conspiracy of goodness. This will be our second annual Conspiracy of Goodness Summit. And we are hoping to create an environment um, that expands even after that day into something where people who have your, your level of good intention where they can connect with projects like yours, where um, where they can try and find their own purpose and meaning in life. You know, what I love about the conversation that we're having is that you are solving one of the world's biggest problems. And there's something about what you see as possible that gets you up every morning and keeps you going through all these opportunities. 
So this event um, is going to give people the opportunity to learn from the lived experiences of people exactly like you and then connect to each other to elevate. We've, we've got to start elevating our best impulses. So join us on October 10th for the second annual Conspiracy of Goodness Summit. It's from 12 to 3 Eastern time. And um, you can find tickets that, there at cogsummit.com. C-O-G, that stands for Conspiracy of Goodness Summit.com. So Damien, let's continue. You know, what you've just um, talked so much about is about how important it is to include all the stakeholders who are as close to ground zero as you as you can. And and then you find the sweet spot in having people create their own futures. I mean, th this is this is what you've what you've uh, stumbled upon, is that as long as we 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 just make it all a military fight. Um, yeah. we, there's always the resistance, but it, if you take that resistance out of it by making this a better thing for everyone in local communities, um, have you found that a lot of the resistance falls away? I'm sure you face obstacles every day, but now mm. have you got people locally pulling for you? Yeah, look, I mean, from a local level, look, and, and don't don't get me wrong, we still. Uh... Uh, we we operating in a, in a, across a region uh, that lost eight thousand elephants in the sixteen years prior to our, our deployment there. Uh, eight thousand times teams of armed poachers coming into an area looking to kill elephants or all the people standing in their way. So uh, this is not just a matter of 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 uh, you know, deploying some 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 teams out there and and assuming everything's going to be okay we we can hope for the best we actually have to prepare for the worst the women have made several hundred arrests um, it's helped drive an 80 percent downturn in elephant poaching across the region we've seen an almost 400 percent increase in wildlife numbers uh in the same time uh there's been this sort of remarkable form of social engineering that's taken place um, over those four years uh in regards to the um perspective of women and and even 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 girls uh in these communities uh, uh on day one when the women came down for selection uh they were, where they were ridiculed told to go back home uh go back to the family the field the kitchen uh this is this is a man's job uh, and they put their heads down and they came and, and they you know they went through the pre-selection and the, the selection phase uh, and all the women that we uh uh, that we do employ. Uh, they're all survivors of serious sexual assault, domestic violence, AIDS orphans, single mothers, uh, and abandoned wives. They're some of the most marginalized uh, women in some of the most uh, toughest rural settings. Uh, um, now, in, 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 in setting all that criteria in the beginning, what we didn't realize is, is we were getting the toughest. Uh, and, you know, I think a, a certain part of that toughness um, has helped the women to just ignore the initial criticism that they were getting in, in terms of what many perceived to be as taking a, a man's job uh, or doing a man's job, you know, whatever job it was. Uh, first pick it always goes to it to almost always goes to a man in, in, in these settings, particularly uh, a job of a ranger. Uh, you know, one of the toughest and most respected jobs um, you will have on the, on the continent or in the world. Uh, you know, definitely one of the most dangerous jobs. Uh, and so over time, we've seen this this acceptance. Um, at first, uh, you know, it's an acceptance, and then it was a, there was a, there was a, there was, a, there was a, a level of respect that was built. And look, I'll say now, not everyone in the community loves the fact that these women have got this job. Um, but after 300 arrests and the results that they've got, uh, they damn well respect it. Uh, and I think, and that's what we, we teach the women. It's not about, and this is not just about in the job you do, it's, it's in life in general. It's not about being liked, it's about being respected. Uh, and then also it, it, the, the benefits that these women are putting back into the community. Okay, there's what they do directly. And there's what they do indirectly. They're part of leading this program, and this program is responsible for the social impact uh, that that I spoke about earlier. So that that loops back um, to the perception of women in the communities. Okay, these women are largely responsible for that social impact that is that is coming in. Uh, but then there's 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 what the women do directly with uh, their own salaries, um, with their own income, going into a largely largely circular economy. Uh, 
where most of the women within 18 months of joining the program have, have, have bought their own land and built their own house. And you know, it's male labor in the communities that are making the bricks and building the houses. And, and, and so there is a flow on benefit, albeit, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a layer or two away from the money that we're paying that's going into the bank accounts of these women. Um, and that's then going on to some of the other men and businesses um, in these communities, but it's still hitting the communities and they're still receiving that sort of um, uh, acknowledgement that they're responsible for that. Uh, there's things that I, I, I spoke about in the beginning, this not being some grand master plan of, of you know, all these, these positives that we're going to come from this, but one of the things that, that we have... Uh, it's been identified for us by the chief of police uh, in the region. He said there's been, there was a, when the program started, he started to see a dramatic upturn in historical reporting for serious sexual assault cases. So women coming forward about things that had happened in the past. He mm. said, um, he said, even though more women were coming forward about things that had happened in the past since the program started, he's seen an overall 60% downward trend in rape and serious sexual assault cases in these communities. And that's a combination of women being, being able to stand up for themselves by being inspired by seeing what the, what the other women are doing in these roles. Um, but also, I think, uh, a level of respect um, with, um, with the men in these communities. We run a program um, called Tackle Africa, uh, and that's soccer coaches that are working with uh, with teenagers, both uh, boys and girls. And you know, part of the clinics, um, they're teaching um, boys and girls about period poverty. They're teaching them about HIV. They're teaching them about um, sexual and reproductive health. And so this is, uh, you know, this is an, alongside the education programs that we run in, in dealing with youth. This is also another angle that we are approaching. And it's part of an overall model that is not just about, you know, going out there and protecting nature. It's about this, this this social impact and how do we uh right. how do we build that holistic um picture yeah oh, it's lovely now you can't be right here on the precipice of talking about children and how this affects things without talking about gosh over the time over the arc of time damien this has got to affect generations of people I mean, you start a whole new ball rolling in a family where a woman has is working with respect of the community probably has a certain level of grace because of it and then authority with people around them, that's got to affect their children and their children's view of what's possible for themselves, right? Yeah, and I, I, I think of it, I would like to think of it as this sort of slow burn revolution for these uh these communities um that are you know in some of the poorest communities in, in some of the, the you know most challenging places to to work and live uh and the i mean the first question we ask these these women when they come into the pre-selection interview phase is what are your dreams what is it that you want to do and uh this program we're not asking a woman to come and be a ranger for the rest of her life what we're doing is providing an opportunity. Um, they got nothing more than an opportunity. There's been no concessions, no handouts. The women did it harder than the men that have been through our programs because in the eyes of most, they had more to prove. They had an opportunity and they made the most of it. Now that opportunity for us is to have some stability, to have an income, to have a job, uh, and to be able to build oneself up and to use this as a platform to go and do what any form of education or career path it is they choose. Um, we will have uh, women that come through this that go and work in politics, women that go and work in healthcare. Um, we've got a, a woman, uh, Nurad Zahota, who just gave a lecture to Harvard Law School uh, um, recently, um, who's about to finish off a, a university degree. Um, a woman that, that uh, you know, some years ago uh, couldn't finish high school because she couldn't aff uh, afford to pay the fees, now owns a house and land right alongside the high school she couldn't once uh, attend, um, finishing off a university degree. You know, women that have, have been able to buy land and build houses, and, and, and for many that means getting their families back together. So this is... Um, it's it's about building up society and, and again with with that that strategy centralized around women uh, and there's you know another another great article in the New York Times a number of years ago and, and the heading says it all just add women and stir and in many respects that's um, that's what 
what we have done. I can't say we were ready for all of the the actions that would flow on from from us starting uh, in, in that direction, but we've been able to adjust uh, as we as we go along, and also not only adjust but to realise the further opportunities that have come uh, from imp implementing this model. And and all that that you you spent the last two or three minutes talking about. You know, on those really challenging days when it seems like you're just up against it, it's probably there's probably some great stories um, in there, personal stories that is what gets you up the next morning, just to get in the fight all over again. I mean, this is this is how we're going forward, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's uh, you know every every woman um, has a, has their own sort of remarkable story sitting through that pre-selection phase. And, and having to listen to the, their background, I would say, is probably some of the most challenging moments of my life, um, knowing that, you know, although I wasn't directly responsible for uh, anything I'd done against these women, um, but I had been part of a culture as part of my boys' club in the military of, of uh, you know, keeping women, um, you know, this... this this culture of, of, you know, trying to keep women oppressed. And that's, uh, you know, but we're all a product of our past. And I suppose being able to reflect on, um, on one, why we were like that in the first place. And for me, it came back to, I mean, it was, it was largely an ego driven, driven thing as part of it, just a culture I grew up in. That's not an excuse. It was just the way it was. But I suppose if we're able to look at where things have not you know, being able to do these self audits um, and say, okay, this wasn't right, and what am I going to do about it? And you know, whether that is looking at at how we've behaved in the past, whether it's looking at at a lifestyle choice that we make, uh, you know, whether it's it's looking at um, you know different career paths that we might be considering, you know, uh, you know, at a time when you know we need to be making better decisions as as individuals in in our life because. You know, doing something good doesn't give us a credit to do something bad. And and with, you know, head, as we head towards 10 billion people on this planet, we need to figure out a better way for us all to live as a global community. Um, we're not the main act. Um, COVID-19 has, has, has told us that we're part of a much bigger system um, and on a planet that's been spinning for over 5 billion years and has survived much worse than human beings and will continue to do so. Uh, and unless we realize really quickly that we're not the main act, um, we're part of this uh, much bigger integrated system, then we're going to be the endangered species. So, uh, you know, I mean, for me, um, I, I always looking at how, you know, how, how I can improve uh, where things may not be right. And the, the evolution of this program was also, you know, a large, you know, evolutionary um, retrajectory for, for, for me. It's, um, yeah, it's it's been a, a steep learning curve operationally, ideologically. Well, one thing we haven't um, talked much about is that, you know, um, again, I'm being asked to speak a lot about this great questioning, this people having this urge that there's something they're, they've, they're uniquely built to contribute and finding that thing. You know, you didn't come from a background of conservation, that, that, at least what I've, I've read, that you were involved in women's rights and a background in in conservation this this almost found you right you didn't find your purpose it found you yeah you, you know it's it's uh and i would say you know a fairly selfish lifestyle leading up to my arrival in africa you know i joined the military for adventure i went to iraq to make money uh, as a private contractor there and i came to africa more looking for a, a fight than a cause and it was just falling into into um you know the direction that i that i that i took working with rangers being inspired by the work that they do um seeing what was happening to animals having come from working within the military having access to all that equipment um shit that the salaries that we were getting uh working in iraq and and for i suppose in, in retrospect uh, maybe not a you know I mean, it's not like we were there trying to trying to win a world war or something. We were looking after the interests of old 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 men, uh, you know, in the ground in, in in natural resources and dotted lines on a map. And um, you know, when you've got time to reflect on that, you know, it's uh, you know, it, it is a part of 
the change um, that I, you know, I, I was willing to go through um, that it came from self interrogation and uh, you know, wanting to wanting to use that for you know, a, a, you know, a higher purpose, mm -hmm. something different. That's it. That that's it. Is that um, whatever course all of us have been on, there are these these moments of self reflection. And thank you for using that word. That. I think that's where we are. We're in a great pause where people are really looking at their priorities and wondering if there isn't some way that they can be a part of a different future than we're headed for. Yeah. So thank you for sharing this, the, you know, this, this big, per perfect example of what's possible. There's so much of that most people would have considered impossible in your story and the, the, the obstacles you found an end run around or the the things that um, that forced you to your back against the wall come up with new ways of looking at things that no one ever thought to connect. So tell me, um, I always like to ask. I've, I've interviewed so many thought leaders who've had just the right person listen to the interview, and then um, some new doors open. Um, tell me if you could wave a magic wand. What would have to happen to take what you're doing to the next level? Um, let me give you a for instance. I was interviewing this woman who who turned around one of the most dangerous high schools in America, Principal Linda Wayman. She has an amazing TED talk that I'll put in the show notes. And Linda and I were talking about her efforts to help children in North Philadelphia, which is arguably one of the most dangerous and and um, poverty stricken places in America. <laughs> and her answer was, "We just need a place to meet." She she was trying to help a whole lot of high school kids that had no place to learn or study or grow or connect. And um, they, the, the, uh, the grocery store <laughs> that they had been meeting in um, closed. Well, this podcast interview with her fell on the ear of someone who is in a very good position in Philadelphia to fund her program for a year and find wow. a place. So yeah. I don't want you to hold back. There's no dreaming big here. Tell me yeah. what, what would happen, what, what, if, if that next level, what's your obstacle from reaching what you would consider the next level? If I only, or if this only happened, then we could get here. Tell me what that is. So, I mean, look, we have the systems, uh, we have the track record, we have the political buy-in in terms of what we do. We have an unlimited amount of, of women waiting to become warriors across the continent. Uh, we have uh, unlimited amounts of land that need to be protected. Uh, and the track record of negotiating these long-term um, deals with local Indigenous communities where they benefit um, from uh, conservation and social investment. Uh, for us, it's a funding thing. You know, and we, we operate each year within uh, uh, a safe margin of our financial projections. Um, so, you know, what we don't want to do is, is try and scale up too big and then be left there the following year and, and, and have nothing in the, in the tank, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, for us, it's, it's, you know, we've, we've built that organizational structure, um, from the policy and procedures to the management, um, to the training capacity. If you gave me $50 million 18 months ago and said, Damon, go and expand this model across the continent, I would have come unstuck because we just didn't have enough people to be able to go out and train the volume of ranges that would be required to protect these areas. So we just, we went out and we built a training facility and trained 14 instructors, indigenous instructors from, from, from Zimbabwe, um, rather than focus on bringing in, you know, foreign military contractors um, that don't understand the, the language or the culture um, and expect these huge paychecks. Uh, and so it was, it was about, you know, identifying where those, those, those blockages were going to be in the expansion of this model. And, uh, and now, you know, I've just finished this, this, uh, this funding round in the U S I'm, I'm off to Europe um, uh, in, uh, in about a week. Uh, we'll go and extend the, 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 the the hat uh, over there and and, uh, and and hopefully be able to raise some more funding. Um, we've got uh, the IUCN conference um, in France, uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the biggest um, uh, conservation conference on our, on our calendar. Um, hopefully we'll have more, um, more investors there in terms of what we do 
um, and then back to the states in October and November. And it's, it's, I mean, one of the most effective things I can be doing for the organisation, um, as well as being part of the, the, the leadership team and, and driving um, innovation and, and, and leadership and, and, and vision, um, is to be fundraising. Um, and if the most if the most beneficial thing I could be doing for this whole program was scrubbing toilets, I'd be out scrubbing toilets. I know you. Would. Um, but. Uh, you know, we've we've had we've had um, you know some really positive, um, not only feedback but financial support um, that's really started to flow in for us as an organisation, and, and you know, this thing is really getting wings. Um, you know, we we started uh, with sixteen women protecting one reserve um, of ninety thousand acres uh, back in two thousand and seventeen. We now have two hundred and forty staff as part of this program eight different nature preserves, all reclaimed from trophy hunting, totaling 1.3 million acres um, in, 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 in area home to millions, if not billions of different animals of all different shapes and sizes. Uh, also just equal importance, you know, the trees and the rivers that flow through these places. These are areas that would otherwise be lost to, to agricultural human settlement. Um, so we have one of the largest land portfolios in, in Zimbabwe that we're helping to protect. This um, success is being replicated now um, in two surrounding countries that we will release very soon um, once the, the ink is dried on the paper. Um, but a, an expansion of that portfolio um, of another 5.9 million acres. Um, we'll spend the next couple of years um, stabilizing those three um, regional programs um, and then just continue to take on more, more and more uh, areas as, as the funding permits. Uh, it will see us move um, soon into uh, into Asia and into the Americas uh, as um, you know as this model gains gains more and more traction. So this is a, a transportable model. There's nothing unique to Africa that you can you can see. I'm sure there's cultural nuances that are very very important, but mm. this is a transportable model. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, you know, and it's not just. You know, this is not. This is not just about conservation. This is about changing the world and the places that we operate. Uh, and I mean, to look at it, you know, look at look at it like this. You know, we came into a small landlocked country in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in a conservation industry that's becoming increasingly antagonistic with local indigenous communities on a continent that's had a seven hundred percent increase in armed conflict in the last decade. All we did is we shifted the male roles to construction and labor, and we put women into the power roles of law enforcement, decision making, and management. In doing so, we completely de escalated tension between our industry and local indigenous communities. We brought them together. Women became the bridge that conservation had to build back into communities. We cut our core operating costs by two thirds. Uh, the first third invested into women is the most effective form of community development funding, and the remaining two thirds that we saved is invested into social infrastructure. Uh, and impact programs like healthcare, education, water sanitation. Um, uh, now, in, in doing this, we've become more successful at conservation um, than we ever have before. Uh, now, if this is possible here in Zimbabwe, what's possible beyond this country? Uh, and most importantly, what is possible beyond this industry? Uh, and I think at the very least, um, women are going to change the face of conservation forever. But um, if we just uh, keep providing opportunities and keep that door open, it's going to be far, far you know, wider impact than just conservation alone. Absolutely. It, it, this is, um, I, I always look for something to open the, the podcast with a, a section of a quote, maybe a minute long. What you just said really does sum this whole realm of possibility um, to a, a pinpoint that all of us can connect to as individuals. Um, if people want to help you, Damien, um, whatever that may be, sharing your story, um, uh, connecting um, your organization with groups or individuals that they know would be incredibly moved and incredibly grateful for knowing that you exist, where can people connect with you? Please jump on our website, have a look, um, or any of our social media media channels. We are the International Anti Poaching Foundation, IAPF.org. Um, have a look. Um, doesn't have to also be us. You just have a look at at organisations that are doing good things, and and most importantly, find where your start place is. 
um, because uh, sitting there trying to figure out where to start is not a start. Uh, and I just go and go and get some forward momentum. The rest will fall into place. Okay, great. Well, so Damien, this has been a true pleasure. I, I'm going to um, to cherish the insights I've learned. I, I look forward to going through the 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 podcast myself and and sharing all these in the show notes. Some some of the key points that we can all take away in our own pursuits. Um, for more information about anything that Damien and I mentioned, look in the show notes. Remember to check out the Conspiracy of Goodness um, podcast for other folks like Damien. And check out everwideningcircles.com. There you can see an article I wrote about Damien about three years ago when our relationship started. We kept trying to be on, get on the same page. And um, oh man, that is one of the articles I'm proudest of writing there among thousands uh, about the innovators who are actually building a wonderful future for us all that we are not hearing about. So um, change is coming. <laughs> I believe, Damien, if it makes you, if, if I could just leave you with a little bit of insight in my work over the last decade of curating the internet and news for um, insight and innovation going on celebrated tells me that there is this enormous wave of goodness and progress happening in the world that almost no one knows about yet because of this horrifying noise, this negative noise in our online lives. But um, I, I believe that you're going to see an upturn in support over the next probably two years. People are questioning this attention economy that's living and the constant negative drumbeat in our lives. And I think a gratitude economy is coming and we will give our attention to people like you who are making the world a better place. So thank you. Thank for, you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, oh and thank you gosh. for everything that you do. Yeah, well, the, we will we will be in connection in other ways because your, yours is one of my uh, most um cherished uh, uh, projects. I, I just love everything about what you're doing. It's an expansion, definitely. Thank you so All much. All right. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, mate. You Thanks. too.